You're on mute. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our opening prayer this morning is from, I forgot who's doing the opening prayer. Got it, Tom. All right, brother. Go ahead and lead us. Good morning, House Church. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings to each of us. You know that each of us have some hurts and pains. Help us to look to you to solve our problems and to provide. Lord, thank you for Bart and Don. Pray that you will bless them and strengthen them. Be with David and Heidi as they bring the service this morning. Guide each one of us. Open our hearts. Open our ears, Lord. And help us to bridle our tongues. Lord, guide each one. Thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to step out of the middle of the picture to allow Dawn and Simon to move in for this bright spot coming up right now. I don't know. Yeah, has it been determined or no? I guess we just determined it. Okay, well, what would you like to say? Because so I'm going to say, to say my bright spot is right here. Haven't seen him since October last year. So yesterday was kind of an interesting day. Simon flew in from Germany, but the first bright spot we had is Thomas, who is on the screen, but just not showing himself. So Thomas volunteers at the airport in Frankfurt. He has an EMT background, but he also works with a lot of the chapels. And he kind of rescues people at the airport who may be stranded or whatever. And Thomas is an old friend of ours. Not that he's old, but we've known him a long time. And he's known Craig too. So Simon got to the airport, he wanted to see the family and the passport area and security check was so crowded that he was gonna miss his flight. And so Thomas basically escorted Simon all the way to getting on the airplane. And you all know Natalie, Natalie was at the airport at the exact same time coming right. This is not the bright spot. No. No, this is not the bright spot. So Natalie was there at the same time, but Thomas was helping Simon, didn't realize that Natalie was in a pickle because of security with her two little boys. It was so bad, she missed her plane. But then back to the bright spot. Yes, right? back to the bright spot. I don't know what quite happened after that, but didn't Thomas go and, and help her out after Yes, that? Thomas yeah. helped her. So he got food and there's Thomas right there. So Thomas really... I could make the bright spot getting to see my grandparents after all the chaos and we had to reschedule a flight because um, actually, or we're actually not. we canceled a flight and they decided to drive up. But really, I think the, the better bright spot is Thomas himself because he took so much time to help so many people, both myself and others, and it really made a chaos. I mean, traveling is always chaotic. It's the nature of the beast, right? But now, uh, yeah. he, he minimized the chaos and uh, maximized our defenses against it. And I'm really appreciative for that. So I would say that's my bright spot. Um, so, well, what happened was Simon had a connection when he landed at JFK Airport in New York City. He had a connection to fly down to Dulles where we are in, in, 11 in minutes. Annapolis. He had actually, when the plane landed, he had about three minutes to go through passport control, get his suitcase. So we knew there was no way he was gonna even consider his connection flight. So Bart had this brilliant idea. Let's just drive up to JFK and we'll meet him. So it was about a four and a half hour drive for us. We threw ourselves in the car. We got to the airport about 15 minutes before Simon's plane landed. Oh, he had just landed. I landed, but the problem was we were also stuck. There was like plane traffic when the yeah, planes the wouldn't be moved out on the tarmac. So I was stay, I yeah. stayed on the tarmac on both ends about an hour and a half each. So, so there were little... Uh, a friend of mine calls these God winks. And so immediately I got on the phone and called Marla and Blues who have a beautiful little apartment up in New York City that they come up and stay at. And because it was so last minute, they said, absolutely, you can stay in our place. So 
we're at Blues and Marla's, God provided, God provided Thomas. I mean, just all along the way. So Simon is here. We're going to go to NYU and start checking out colleges. We got about two or three every day to check out for the next week. So yes, God has just been so faithful throughout the whole thing. He safely arrived on time. Made it through passport in what, 10 minutes? Yeah, no. I, I, that was a God thing. I ran ahead of the crowd. <laughs> yeah. So that's our bright spot. Mm -hmm. So Naomi in the Democratic Republic of Congo is going to bless us this morning with a song. Um, may, John? May yes, go ahead. Thomas has his hand raised real quick. Yeah. And he's I, would like to, I would like to add one more thing. Natalie and the boys got out last night. They were able to be rebooked standby flying via San Francisco back to Ohio. And I assume everything went smooth in San Francisco, though, so they should be home in Ohio now for about two hours or so, two, three hours. Wow. Unbelievable. Thank you, Thomas, for blessing Thank the family. Thank you so much, yeah. Okay, Naomi. Yeah. Thanks, Mother Dom. Naomi said she's going to sing a song titled, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Sang Singing in French language. Go ahead, Emma. Il a pli déjà, pli déjà donné. Il a pli déjà a donné, a donné. Understood, Adonai. We all we all know that word. Please, Flavian, tell her thank you so much for sharing that with us this morning. Johnny. Johnny, we are ready for prayers. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for that beautiful song. It's so awesome that you did that last minute. Just pray with me over all these prayer requests. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, we just lift up all these praises and prayers to you, Lord, and each one that um, isn't on this list, Lord. I just thank you for all your blessings for this week. We love you, Jesus. Today, God, we just praise you for Jason's great trip and his safe return from Switzerland. Praise you for keeping our missionary families in Malawi and DRC healthy and blessing their ministries. For Bart and Don's grandson Simon's visit and college tours. Lord, just bless the rest of their visit. Lord, we pray today for an end to the war in Ukraine and for world leaders to work together in that region. 
for the people of Afghanistan after an earthquake during mass hunger and economic challenges. For Pam and John Holt, whose home was severely damaged by water while out of the country, and what reached great could give them a safe trip home. For Naomi's grandmother, who is in the hospital for diabetes, or just till her body can be with her. For a durable safety and security, especially in Eastern DRC and throughout the DRC. Lord, just bless our friends, keep them safe, and, and their ministry. Uh, for Joan's sister in law, Gretchen, who is expected to pass this weekend and is being kept comfortable with hospital care and family around her, that her passing would be peace, Lord. I praise you that she's at peace and ready when you call her home. For Joan's granddaughter, Alexandra's surgery on Tuesday, and for all to go well, and that she has a good recovery, or just be with Joan too, and her trip. Um, for hip surgery for Pete Proctor, he's scheduled after many delays, so that it will be successful, and that he will have restored. Mm -hmm. Or just be with his sister during all of this. So for Joshua Reason, to remain healthy, or just be with him, touch his body, still his lungs. For safe travels for Patrick and Mervis as they travel to and from Frontier and for their ministry along the way. Or just bless their trip. For Heidi's sister Debbie, who went into the hospital after a stroke and needs therapy. Or just be with both of them in all this. And um, let the therapy be effective. For Whiskey Bob on his motorcycle trip from Baltimore to the Arctic Circle, Lord, just put angels around him and um, give him safety. For safe travels this summer, for everyone who's part of House Church, in your name, Jesus, all these things. We pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, Psalm 1914. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Evil words destroy one's friends. Wise disconcernment rescues the godly. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. A person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook, like apples of gold in settings of silver. A like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken at the proper time. Do you want us to read this? Mm -hmm. all right. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have made, who have been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Truly, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Words is the word for the week. And that's the story of our lives, isn't it? For better or for worse. Think about it. Words cannot be retrieved. So before you say anything, don't say anything. Think about it. By your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. 
And this word for the week words, which we all use, uh, some more than others, some too much and some not enough. The theme is uh, David Miranda, since I asked him to take this Sunday and bring the message and he's about to do so. I want to thank David personally and the friendship that Don and I have with David and Heidi and their son in particular and their family in general. What a blessing. And all that has come together really through House Church. So, David, I'm going to turn it over to you from this point on and bring us God's word through your words. David, you're on mute. There you go. All right. Well, I'm going to stand up because my bottom is getting numb. <laughs> um, Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit. Um, we've been having a study with uh, some other men in church that really affected me about having wisdom and with wisdom, get understanding. And uh, part of it was chapter three in James, the book of James. And I'll go ahead and read it as we break it down. And I'll tell you different experiences that I've had with, uh, with uh, some of these words here. Hold on. I think you guys should get a better look at how handsome I am right now. There we go. Um, okay. So in James, starting with uh, chapter two, James three. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although... They are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So in the morning group, we had some um, discussion about Words, words that we've had that have affected us either in a negative way, in a, in, a, in a positive way. Sometimes things that we don't want to hear can build us up. Sometimes the things that are told good, good to us maybe don't affect us that well, maybe because we don't believe the sincerity of them. But we're going to talk about how the how they affect uh, words have on us, the effect words that we have uh, that we use can affect other people. Um, how many times have we ever heard, watch your mouth? Or how many times have we said it? Hey, watch your mouth. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about this and the words we use, the things that you've said in the past, things that uh, maybe you said to your child, to your wife, the person down the street, um, a close friend, or maybe a not so close friend. So I'll share some of the things that have been um, affecting, not affecting me, but have affected me in the past, either by example, or things that I've said. Um, the mouth, the 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 uh, examples used are the horses. And uh, with the thing with horses was you control them. We can build others or we can tear them down. The wind, as it carries a ship, cargo ships would carry uh, cargo important to uh, different cities. But if they're not controlled, People will lose their supplies. The ship will go and, and, and it can cause disaster. And then we'll talk about fires here in a little bit, how using our words in appropriate way, we can really hurt somebody and destroy them. So let's start the let's start with some words that scripture uses. We're going to go with Proverbs 25, verse 11. 25 verse 11 says, and we spoke about earlier, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. In Proverbs 16, 23, it says, a wise man's heart guides his mouth and his lips promote instruction. I have a story about my sons. Uh, I had three boys and they all were wrestlers in high school and uh, all three of them progressed to college. And, um, Two of them, one just finished wrestling at the Naval Academy, and one is continuing to wrestle, wrestle at his school. So uh, I'm going to talk about 
the coach we had, Coach Branstetter. He was a, a national wrestling coach, Hall of Famer. Um, he uh, just a great wise man who wanted to build young men through wrestling. Um, he encouraged prayer. We would pray on the mat before they start a match or tournament, and then we pray after. Well, he years ago in I think 1994, there was this uh, kid named Justin Woodruff. And he was ranked number one here in the San Diego section for wrestling and ranked in the state. And uh, what happened was he uh, was wrestling. He was seated number one. He was a top guy in San Diego. And during wrestling, he uh, lost a match, lost in the semifinals. And he, he was so upset. He had just heard that he did not make it into the Naval Academy. And uh, when he when the coach told me the story, he said that uh, Justin Woodruff, went to the football field and started crying. When I talked to coach Woodruff, he ended up being one of our coaches. He said that he went in the bushes and was crying. The coach found him, took him out of the bushes or the football field and spoke to him for like four to five minutes, basically tell him, Hey, you can still come back. You can still place high enough where you can compete at the state tournament. Gave him those words, got Justin back in. Justin took third, ended up going to state, the state tournament at the state tournament. He lost his very first wrestling match. Same thing. He left. I quit wrestling. I don't want to do this. This is stupid. And he left. Coach Brownsetter went out and talked to him again and uh, got him back in. He won his next seven matches. Now he's wrestling for the third and fourth place spot because he lost one match. He um, lost, but came in fourth, top eight in the state. There's like 800 high schools in, in, in California. There's no division. So when you place in state, you're one of the top people in the state. Well, then next thing you know, he gets a phone call from the Naval Academy. Hey, guess what? We reviewed your grades. We think you're Naval Academy material. So he ends up going to the Naval Academy and wrestling at the Naval Academy. While at the Naval Academy, he met his wife, got married, went over and served his time as a helicopter pilot. Then he comes back to Poway High School. And he uh, becomes a teacher and a coach. Now comes in my son. Jonathan uh, wanted to be in the Marines. And Coach Woodruff, he was nine, he was nine at the time. And Coach Woodruff said, hey, if you're going to be a Marine, you might as well be an officer. If you're going to be an officer, you might as well go to the Naval Academy. And if you go to the Naval Academy, you might as well, I mean, if, you, if you're going to, if you're going to be a Marine, be an officer. If you're going to be an officer, then you go to Naval Academy. And to get in the Naval Academy, you have to be in good shape, do well in your spo uh, sports, and do really well in school. And he told Jonathan when he was nine, when you go home, I want you to do push-ups. When you watch TV, do 100 push-ups when the commercials come on. So Jonathan would do it. He was so steadfast. He wanted to go. He wanted to be, he wanted to be in the military. He wanted to... Um, be a Marine, and he wanted to do something special. Well, then time goes by. He has his best friend, Jacob. They go, and they're working out like crazy, and they go, and they do well in their sports, and they're straight-A students. In fact, Jason's best friend, Jacob, was school valedictorian. So they go to the Naval Academy. While at the Naval Academy, both Jonathan and Jacob got selected to go into um, elite special warfare, got selected to go through uh, – SEAL training. So they haven't started that yet. But while in there, although Jonathan did not want to go in and find a girl, he didn't have time for girls. He met a beautiful girl, ended up marrying her. So he went from nine years old to want to be Marine through some kind words, not kind words, but building words from Coach Brandstetter to this Justin Woodruff set a chain of events where now he comes out following his dreams, how we can use to build people with our words. And uh, so now let's look at what Jesus says about words. Well, I'm, I'm going to take this out of Matthew. And excuse me going back and forth. I just want to um, be able to share a little bit. In Matthew 4, or I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. This is the time. Oh, these are the building words that Jesus used when he talked to the people. Uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Sadducees at that time. The teachers of the law, they would go and they would um, tell you all the things you're doing wrong and what you need to do 
to make yourself uh, uh, pleasing to God. Here's what Jesus said. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and traveled by men. So here's what Jesus said. He goes, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven. When we speak to people, we need to speak life into them. We need to go and, and give them the truth and build them up. God will be praised by the way we do, by the way we talk to people and uh, the way we share Christ's love with them. Unfortunately, we got the building words, but now we got our words that tear down. Um, I have this piece of paper. Sometimes when we use our words and we're thinking, hey, guess what? I'm going to make you better by chipping away at what you have. So we'll say some words to just cut them. We don't realize the things we say, but it makes us feel good. It makes us feel more justified in how we're making them better. Then we'll say something else. You know what? You have these issues. You have these problems. You have these issues. You have these problems. You need to fix yourself. Or we'll tell them, hey, guess what? You're, you're not really worth anything. Get your head straight. You know, and we just totally rip them. We cut them and we rip them. So what do we do? Hey, let me apologize, right? I'm so sorry I shouldn't have said that. So you come in and you say, hey, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Let's make things, please forgive me. I really didn't mean that. I was just in a bad mood. I was hungry. I was just tired, whatever. So uh, let me put that on. And when we really rip them apart, we say, gosh, you know, that's not like me. I'm going to go ahead and let's make things better. So we put this down. So then what happens is you get this piece of paper, right? It looks almost normal, ah, but you got these things. So when you, when you say these words, the words don't disappear. It might look like it's okay and you can still use it, but they don't go away. And that's what we, that's what we are. That's the problem we have. Those are what we stuck with, what we're stuck with. Um, I don't know if I mentioned today at all, but I had kids that were wrestlers. So we were at a wrestling tournament and um, <laughs> I'm just waiting. So we're at a wrestling tournament and uh, Josh, my oldest boy was wrestling and he wrestled and he, wrestled, he beat some good kids and kids that we were surprised that he beat. And, um, and, and they were good competitors. And then there was this kid named Andrew Schulte. He's wrestling in the finals. Josh is in the finals. Everyone's surprised he's in the finals. Um, so these kids that he beat previous came up to him and they said, hey, Josh, you're going against Andrew. And uh, Josh's like, okay. And then they're telling him and they're helping him, right? Josh, watch out for this move. Watch out for that move. And Josh's head's kind of spinning, but these guys that he beat came up to him and were trying to lift him up, build him up. In the meantime, Josh's head is spinning. So he wrestles Andrew. While he was wrestling Andrew, he got destroyed. This guy just totally destroyed him, just way better wrestler. And he um, ended up uh, beating Josh pretty bad. So he won the championship. Jason, uh, Josh took second. And so afterwards, as we're going, people are in the middle, they, Josh saw Andrew sitting in the corner, gets the wall, and he's, um, he's, he's crying. So Josh sits next to him. What's going on? He goes, I don't understand. Um, I won this championship. I won the state championship for the, you know, for the kids. And he goes, but my dad just was just yelling at me. He goes, why didn't you do what I, why didn't you do what I told you to do here? Why didn't you? take him down this way or pin him or do this. He goes, but dad, I won. <clears throat> and the dad's like, you know what? 
You don't know what you're doing. You need to listen to me. Um, so Josh sat next to him. And as he came up and sat next to him, these other kids that this kid had beaten and that Josh had beaten sat next to him and, and gave him, I put their arms around him and said, hey, you know what? Things are good. We're going to be okay. So we got to be worried. We got to worry about what we say, how it's perceived, and we can't destroy. Um, let's see something that Jesus did when he had to go against criticism in a way. So this is going to be from Mark 14, 5, 4, and 5. Criticism in attack, Mark 14, verses 4 and 5. This is going to be um, when, when this uh, woman was anointing Jesus' feet. Um, she brought some perfume, and she went to anoint Jesus' feet, and she started washing and cleaning his feet. So he said, uh, going with verse 4, some of those present were indignant to each other. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for a year's wages and money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. She's honoring Jesus. She's praising him, and she's clean, cleaning him in the way that's the most loving way. And they're criticizing. How many times have we done that where we go, we criticize people, saying you should have done it this way. You could have. Why weren't you smart enough to do it this way? So what did Jesus say? Jesus went in verse 6. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. When we're getting criticism and someone comes alongside and says, hey, you know what? You're doing okay. I'm with you. We mentioned earlier discussion um, before the service that coming alongside someone and helping them, lifting them up to where they've got, you know, they, they're able to go. Your good deeds shown before men and praise God. So now we got the other part. We got the words to heal. Let's look at some of the verses here that uh, we use for healing. And there are so many verses. It, it is just awesome. As I was going through this, and I was going through this, I was speaking more to myself. And I thank you so much for letting me share a little bit of what, I, what I've gotten for myself. And hopefully some, you know, hopefully that this will be useful to you guys. So with Proverbs, words to heal, Proverbs 12, 18. Proverbs 12, 18. Sometimes when we think we're uh, doing some good, maybe not so much. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. We need to be able to bring these healing words. We need to be able to not use our words so much to cut. Even some of the words um, that we use that might not be a compliment, given in love, the criticism will build them up. Proverbs 15.1. And yes, my arms are getting tired from flipping back and forth. 15.1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Things that we say that might make us feel better, because look how much smarter, better I am than you, tear people down. We need to look at words that we can use to build them up. Same thing in a different way. Tone is huge. And then the last verse I wanted to bring up when this part was in Proverbs 16, 23. In James, it says, seek wisdom, but with wisdom, seek understanding. So 16, 23 says, a wise man's heart guides his mouth. And his lips promote instruction. When we have a chance, we need to go and promote instruction to teach these people. I teach at a paramedic school. And we have some of the trainers that have the feeling that I need to break you down to build you up. And I'm like, gosh, why would you do that? When you have someone who might not feel confident in their skills, we need to go and we need to uh, build them up. Say, hey, this is what you've done well. Okay, now let's fix these little things to help me even better. Why fix something that's already going okay? Let's start improving the problems that you might have 
and make you better, more effective. So this is what I'm hoping to accomplish and share that maybe things that we can do if we slow down a little bit and speak what we uh, speak life into people. There's so much, oh my gosh, there's so much terrible stuff out there that's causing us to want to be angry or maybe be self-righteous or be judgmental. And we need to stop for a minute and think about what we say and then, uh, and then breathe life, give life into people. Um, we have opportunities to share God's love with our words. How can we tell someone God loves you when we just got finished telling them, you know what, you're this, you need to do this. Why the heck were you thinking this? We need to go and use our words to share God's love because with our deeds is how they'll really see who God is. And we need to build spirits hearts and to let the love of Christ overflow, our heart, overflow from our hearts and tame our tongue. So um, in John 8, 3 through 11, we're going to talk about John 8, 3 through 11, we're going to talk about John 8, hopefully I got it right. Yeah, John 8, 3 through 11. We're going to talk about when this woman was caught in adultery. And everyone, uh, we learned about the adulterous woman, she was she was caught as a sinner, but Jesus saw her as more than that. He saw her like he sees us. So he went alongside her and advised accusers, verse 7. So verse 3 says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, such women. Now, what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But what did Jesus do? He went down, he bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When he kept on questioning him, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said, hey, if any of you is without sin, you be the first one to cast the first stone. So we need to heal come alongside, build people, get rid of some of our judgments and, 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 and give truth and build. So now let's go back to James three, James three. We're going to talk about the horse, the bit, the bridle to guide the horse. Horses can be used to, uh, transport people they were used to build cities they were built they were used to build uh, uh roads the horse was a tool they used if we can control our tongue like that the way that horse is being controlled um don mentioned earlier in discussion you try to ride a horse bareback with no bridle it goes wherever it wants to go or it stays in the barn and eats we need to control that to build we can build people the way horses were used back in the old days not let it go crazy. Let's talk about ships. They're cargo ships. Cargo ships carried items from one place to another to feed cities, feed families, bring stuff from around the world for world trade. You got the wind. You can kind of control the wind with sails, but the wind takes you wherever you want to go. Um, take you way off course. What happens with that? The ships crash. They get lost. People are lost. So what do we use? We have a pilot on the ship that has a rudder, small little rudder that guides it. If we can be that rudder with our thoughts, so when we come out of our mouth, we heal, we build. How much more can we do feeding that into other people? And now, my, my I guess especially, we fire. So we have fire. Fire destroys a small little spark. That's uh, out here in California, we've been having a lot of fires. Some uh, uh, set. Some where someone is doing yard work with some electrical equipment, set a little spark. Sometimes with the heat, the dryness, and the wind, 
such a huge fire, burns down homes, forest fires, or even, even you're driving your car, if you don't maintain it, the catalytic converter will uh, uh, break and sparks go in the bushes. That tiny little smart, spark, 100% of all fires can be put out with just a cup of water with that little spark. But if that little spark is not controlled, destroys everything. So here in California, because we have the issue with fires, we try to do these things called controlled burns where we set forests on fire. We set it up, we protect the areas around, we have our equipment, and then we start setting little fires to burn off um, um, some of the old growth. So these fires destroy the old growth, leaves, twigs, they destroy um, uh, a lot of the invasive insects that can destroy the forest and they clean the forest. They allow new vegetation to grow, new trees, New foliage, a lot of uh, animals to come back and start and start uh, uh, replenishing. So if we control this, if we control our tongue, if we control that little spark that lets us just say all kinds of things that hurt, if we use it in a way where we can go and, and, and share with people to allow that patient, that patient, the person to heal, get better, stronger because of the words we use. Oh my gosh, praise God for that if we can do that and lift people up. And also as we allow the new growth, what do we do? We prevent future fire, uh, future forest fires because of the new growth. Um, we have this chance to share the love of Jesus and use this love to serve others. It's not easy. But if we lean our heart towards Christ in all ways we can honor him with our words. And I want to close with this last little part and thank you so much for your patience. John 8, 31. It says 8, 31. To the Jews who had believed in Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. To honor God, we need to show him that we really are his disciples by controlling our tongue. He said, oh, I think I might have, yeah, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to speak. And as we use our words together, um, Bart, is it okay if I pose on you to do communion with us? Oh, you know what? Be yeah, we'll do communion, and Bart. And I know you're the hand yeah. signal. Sure. Communion and then go into a time of discussion. Would that be good? Yeah. Or should we do discussion before communion? Okay. Do you want, no, do you want discussion before communion or communion? It's up to you, David. I would love to have discussion before communion. So. Okay. With that, and I'm going to sit down because now my legs are tired. With that, uh, if I could just get a couple of uh, people that maybe might want to share a little bit where um, someone's word has really made a difference and really built you up. And I don't want to bring up any pain for anybody that want to talk about words that destroy them or hurt them. But if you want to share a little bit of that, or maybe an example where um, you use the word, words where you built someone up and you didn't realize it until, um, until uh, later on when they said, hey, thank you so much. I, that was what I needed to hear at that particular time. So just a couple of answer, uh, examples, and then we'll go ahead and go into a time of communion. And make sure I'm mute before you uh, speak because I can't hear you. Oh, see, there's my beautiful wife. There's a word. <laughs> David, uh, a thought comes to my mind. For a number of years, I knew a woman who she could say something nice about people. But in any conversation, she would have to enter some negative aspect. And 
it just tainted everything that she said good and was hurtful to so many people that she was speaking with. And it was just sad to see somebody who felt, I don't know whether it was insecurities or what, that they had to run somebody down no matter what was going on. Yeah. When I was in fourth grade, there was a girl who was very autistic and she was uh, like bullied for it. And I didn't do anything like, so I, I would just talk to her. I did less than the bare minimum, but because others weren't necessarily doing that, she really deeply appreciated it. And that's happened a couple of times where very simple, extremely small acts have such an outsized impact on people. I was actually a little bit uncomfortable because somebody moved away and they cared a lot more about me than I cared about them because I was doing, and they wanted me to like say goodbye and all that. And it was because I was doing the bare minimum and saying the bare minimum. And it wasn't that others wouldn't do it. It's that sometimes you have to be persistent in how you pursue saying that to people because sometimes they push you away before you can do that or um, they don't want to hear it or they don't trust you or some other thing. And so um, I, I don't know, it's just always been remarkable to me how very small things like saying hi to somebody in the morning and making eye contact can have such a, not even positive, not even positive words can have such an impact on people. Um, and it's it, like, we all have, we have a, a ton of power within us just with how we go about in the world. We're all going to change the world whether we not want to or whether we don't just by walking around and deciding whether or not we're gonna look somebody in the eye and say hi or not, right? Treating people like a person. And uh, yeah, not a specific story, just a thought and reaction to the sermon. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I just wanna say, based upon what Simon just shared, I saw it happen about three times yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, drove, we, we drove in from the airport and we're pulling into the parking garage and the first one was the wrong garage. And so the guy is talking to us and Simon made a point, have a great day. Thank you very much, sir. And he did that like three times to different people. I don't know if you were aware of it, but I was aware of it. And sometimes indirectly, we hear someone affirm someone else and it goes, oh, that was a nice thing. I should have done that. So, that was nice. Thank you. I remember one time I was taking him for a ride on my motorcycle a long time ago. It was a number of years. And the whole time he was on the back of the motorcycle, he was just waving at people. <laughs> I'm going, don't do that. <laughs> no, I mean, he was just very friendly to everybody that was out there on the street and they probably got charmed by it. Yeah. Maybe in my mind, I was more like a porno celebrity or something, like way <laughs> into the crowd. No, I don't think so. You were just being yourself. Maybe. It's a good thing. Thank you. Good thing. Anybody else? Anybody else that has anything that, um, where a word really affected him? And uh, either in a positive way, maybe in a negative way that made you stronger. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, there, there's something somebody said in the chat. Yeah, what are you saying, Mike? Mike, yeah, go ahead and unpack that. Well, it was a secondhand story uh, from my barbers. And they knew a guy, they knew both the guys and, and one guy's wife died and of his acquaintances, only one person came over to express their condolences. And the guy who lost his wife gave, gave the guy $150,000. Wow. Now there were others, <laughs> it's kind of concrete, I know, but, uh, but there were other stories surrounding it that, you know, I don't, I don't know how grounded in uh, Christianity 
you know, or the teachings of Jesus it was. But anyway, it's an interesting story. So my daughter, when she left for Germany, she says, Mom, you got to get an Instagram account because we're going to be showing. So she had to show me how to do it, blah, 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 blah. But there, with what you just said, Mike, there are Instagram posts on people who just randomly will go into somebody like in a Walmart or a gas station and they look for somebody who maybe looks like they could use a helping hand and they'll go up to them and they'll say, hey, I want to buy this birthday card for my mom. Um, do you have a dollar? And these people are like, sure. And it's probably the last dollar they have. Sure, here's a dollar. And he said, well, actually, I promised myself I was going to give $1,000 to the first person who wanted to help me. And they all are just so moved by this gesture of kindness. And so that triggered my thought, Mike, with what you just said. Wow. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we all did that? Just go up to somebody at a gas station and Everyone say, yeah. Mm. Hey, Don, do you need a dollar? <laughs> 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 Two in New York City actually falls. <laughs> all right, guys. Hey, I, know, I know you're going to your um, the time of communion very quickly, but I, I was at a gathering of a bunch of pastors uh, a couple of weeks ago, and one of them, who is very well known in Washington, D.C., uh, and he is at these event, events all the time. He has a very large congregation. He says, you know, I've given a lot of sermons, and I have all of them on tape and stuff, and I really ought to be a better person than I am. I really ought to listen to what I have to say. And what really amazes me, he said, and another pastor of many years chimed in also in the same way saying, you know, I give a message and somebody maybe comes up afterwards and says, that really spoke to me. And he says, well, what spoke to you? And they tell him and he said, I didn't really, that wasn't the point of my message. He doesn't tell them that, but they got something out of it that um, was for them. And he just kind of backed away from his words and said, well, you know what? You're saying all these words. What do people really take away? I don't know what they take away, but I do know what I'm taking away from this one, David, and maybe this wasn't your intent. <laughs> but when you did the little piece on Jesus, uh, referring to that with the woman who's caught in adultery, it reminded me of the slide that says the words for the week and to think about it. When I write something say, think about it, I have to ask myself, Bart, are you thinking about it or are you just writing this for other people to think about? And the thought was, before you say anything, don't say anything. That's something Bart needs to hear. And when I look and think about that passage, Jesus is asked a question. This woman's been caught in adultery in the very act. The law says stoner. What do you say? He doesn't say anything. He, he draws in the dirt. The only uh, indication of Jesus ever writing anything is drawing in the dirt. What was he doing? Was he drawing in the dirt thinking, I got to get, get a good comeback here. Father, what, what should I say? We don't know. But it's what I think I would call a pregnant pause. The baby's about to be born, but it's not yet born. So, David, thank you. I need more pregnant pauses in my life to ponder and think before I speak. So that's one way that your message has spoken to me, and I appreciate it. Well, thank you. You know, like I said, it was speaking for myself, speaking to me. And uh, I definitely am guilty of, uh, you know, of everything that I was hopefully trying to teach myself. So, all right. Ready to go into a time of communion? Yes. All right, coach. <laughs> you would like me to? Okay, no, heck no. I want to do this. Good. I love it. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so let's go to as we go into this time, and thank you so much for this for this opportunity, Bart. Thanks a lot. Um, we're gonna go in in the Lord's Supper. Um, and I'm going to take this out of 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26. Or from 23, uh, the, 
the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Who would share? Amen, David. That was beautiful. And you all you did was share the words of Jesus. Those yes. words are powerful. And it's the, really the words that matter. And let me tell you why. I'm going to give the benediction in a moment. But I have never done communion. And I did it with Don and my grandson here. Communion is such a solemn thing. And it's about the words, isn't it? It's not about the items, but you got to do the best you can. We're staying in somebody's house and we don't want to take what is theirs. So we just took what we brought, which is a pretzel. <laughs> okay. This is not a host that's been blessed in some way. This is just a pretzel, but it's the best that we could do. We didn't, have any, we didn't have any water, wine, which is my preference because of the symbolism. But we do have some water. Water and bread, bread and water. Man does not live on bread and water, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. His words are our bread. He is the water that bubbles up to eternal life. So ordinarily, our preference is wine and that unleavened bread, but I believe God understands. I hope so. It's all in the words, isn't it? Thank you for your words, David, and those that have been shared today. Now here's the word of the Lord as a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And let our words be words of peace to those with whom we come in contact today. And always parting greetings saying, hey, have a nice day. So folks, have a nice day. We love you. Love you all. See you next time. Thank you, Thank you David. So much. Thank you, David. Be blessed. Bye-bye. Thank you.